Hi everyone and welcome to Day in the Life for Developmental Psychology. I am so excited by today's event. It is a long time in the making. I have wanted uh, to have Dr. Lauren Marhoney as a guest um, for the Day in Life for quite a while. Um, she is one of our um, faculty here at SPS and she brings so much to this job in terms of real life experience and um, experience that many of you are very interested in. Often when I have conversations with you, you tell me that you're interested in working with school children, you tell me that you're interested in working with young people and in making a difference in people's lives. And that is exactly what Dr. Mahoney is doing. She has her doctorate in school psychology and she is a CUNY BA graduate having gone to Hunter College. Today she'll tell us about her journey to psychology and her journey within psychology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lauren Mahoney. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this event, Dr. Mahoney. Thanks for inviting me. I'm kind of excited about it. I might be a little nervous, so um, you know, I'll, I'll warm up in like two minutes. Uh, so my name is Dr. Lauren Mahoney. I am CUNY grown. I uh, go home to college. Um, my sister actually went to SPS uh, in the business department and she had a really valuable experience. Um, I love CUNY. Uh, I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at Queens College. That's how I started my career um, at CUNY. Uh, I love everything about higher education. I love everything about college students. Um, I, I really kind of feel I'm like where I'm supposed to be, you know, I know it sounds cheesy. But <laughs> I'm like very, very happy with my career path. Um, but I didn't always want to be a psychologist. I didn't always want to be a professor. I always wanted to be a nurse. Um, if you asked anybody in my family um, throughout my entire childhood and high school experience, even halfway through college, um, I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to be a nurse um, anesthesiologist specifically. I wanted to work in the operating room. I wanted to work with chemistry. Um, I always loved the hard sciences, biology and chemistry specifically. And when I was in high school, I, you know, I was really good with chemistry. I don't know how that happens because I'm terrible with math, but somehow, some way, chemistry was my jam. Um, I attended Hunter College after graduating from high school. I'm born and raised in Staten Island no judgment. Um, I left Staten Island when I was 18 and moved to Manhattan and that was a wonderful experience. And I lived in Brooklyn for a little while, I lived in Queens for a little while. The only place I haven't put my, uh, my bed in is the Bronx, but I spent a lot of time in the Bronx because I have a lot of friends that live up there. Um, you know, so I love New York City. Um, but I attended Hunter College because they had a world renowned nursing program. And again, oh, I'm sorry, the bell's ringing. Um, and the really great thing about Hunter is that it's right in the middle of New York City. There's everything. Um, and nursing was something that I had always had a passion for. Um, I had a life altering experience uh, halfway through my time at Hunter. And, and, and I, took a, I took about a semester off. I took one class that semester uh, just to kind of recover from, you know, whatever was going on. And my first semester back, I took abnormal psychology and that was game over. I absolutely loved it. I, I, I the patho psychopathology is uh, so exciting and I like, I can't even talk about it. I feel so passionate about it. I, I just, I find it to be fascinating. And I stopped being a nursing student and became a psychology major. And, you know, while I was attending college, I was a bartender and a waitress. And we all know bartenders are amateur psychologists. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed sitting down and talking to various people of age, you know, ethnicity, religion. I loved learning everything about their lives. And, um, I, but I really loved helping them process their feelings uh, and just being a person to listen. I had a very different view of what therapy was when I was a bartender versus what I am now, and I'm sure I made many mistakes um, on the other ends of the bar, but hey, you know, um, it's kind of what helped shift my career path from being a nurse to being where I am now. Um, during my undergraduate studies, I loved biopsychology and um, behavioral neuroendocrinology. I think it's fascinating how neurotransmitters and hormones and genetics and evolution all kind of come and play this huge factor 
um, in one's behavior. Uh, upon graduation from Hunter, I I thought I would get the couch with the little arm chair, you know, when I was gonna, was gonna be a psychologist and it's gonna be great. Um, my first job out uh, with a bachelor's in psychology was a direct care worker in a nonprofit organization on Staten Island. Shout out to Anya Mark. They do be they they were doing beautiful things 20 years ago and they continue to do beautiful things uh, to the present day. And it really kind of helped me focus a little bit more on what part of, there's so much in psych, who knew this? I didn't. So much in psychology that you can study. Um, yeah. And developmental disabilities in education yeah. seem to be like kind of where my rate, you know, my honing device was going towards. Yeah. Um, but I really had no idea what to do with my bachelor's degree. And I also didn't really know what to do um, with my education path. So I ended up transferring to another nonprofit in Staten Island called Eden 2. And Eden 2 um, is a school for uh, autistic children. They have uh, lifelong programs across, you know, an adult program, I'm sorry, and a bunch of different, or, you know, uh, all across Staten Island and, and some programs in Long Island. And I loved working there. I, I worked with some of the best um, behavior analysts and speech, you know, Dr. Joanne Gerenser, she's a pillar in the speech community. Frank Cicero is a pillar in the field of behavior analysis. And I studied under them and worked under them and mentored under them. Um, for many years. And I always thought that I wanted to work in a psychiatric hospital, you know, with my psychology degree. So I enrolled in Queens College's um, Clinical Behavioral Applications Program. It's no longer there, but you were going to be basically a board certified behavior analyst when you were done. Board certified behavior analysts, you know, really look at the environment and behavior and they develop skill programs to help people you know, just really live their best life um, by teaching socially significant behavior. And I found that to be fascinating. And, and I wanted to work in a psychiatric ward. I wanted to go where the magic was happening. Um, and then I got pregnant, you know? And so I was like, maybe I don't want to work in a psychiatric ward pregnant. So then I kind of had to go back to the drawing board. And I remember a couple of years back, I was, uh, you know, a very good, a friend of a friend, I should say, um, we had gone to high school together, but we weren't friends with him. And he was talking about how he was in the school psychology program at Long Island University. And I was like, didn't really think of it back then. I just remember being like, that's cool. Um, and then I was like, what do school psychologists do? And then I actually looked on the internet. I consulted the Google and I was like, oh my God, that's great. I want to do that. I want to work in a school. I want to work with, with kids. I want to help them learn. I want to help them be, you know, the best student they can be, the best kid they can be, and then eventually the best adult they can be. And, you know, everything about school psychology, I was just like, this is it. This is exactly what I need to do. Um, and so I applied for LIU's program at Brooklyn, the Brooklyn campus. And uh, Dr. Levanis and Dr. Sapunzis uh, took a chance on a, on a crazy girl with a four-month-old baby at home um, who was fiercely Skinnerian um, behavioral and Dr. Saponzis was a psychoanalytic professor. And so we are like on opposite ends of the spectrum. It's like a conservative Tea Party Republican going up against a liberal Democrat. Like they just don't, there's no middle ground. Um, but for whatever reason, it got into the program. And I had a very difficult time balancing work and life. And you know, I worked full time, went to school full time. I had a baby. Um, very grateful to the assistance from my friends and family because that's how I went to class. When I graduated from LIU, I was hired as a school psychologist at Eaton too. Um, I was working in Staten Island and in the Long Island program. In the maybe about a year or two after I graduated, you know, I graduated, um, I took a, uh, I, I enrolled in the University of North Texas and became, uh, got a post-master's graduate certificate in applied behavior analysis, sat for the um, BAC BACB, you know, test, and I became a BCBA. And I was like, this is great. I'm a school psychologist, board certified behavior analyst. I'm living the dream. Um, my job at Eden was amazing. I did everything that I wanted to do. I was testing kids. I was doing counseling. I was doing consultation work. I was doing parent training. We were presenting all kinds of research internationally, like behavior management techniques, parent training techniques, um, 
you know, staff, did I say staff training? I might have, I don't know, but just you name it. We, we were like really in the thick of it. And um, everything we did was rooted in, you know, any of our interventions were all based on existing research. And so I then started to develop this data-driven mind, you know, so I'm really very grateful for my, my time um, and my experience at Eden, because I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, they had a huge, huge impact on the person I am today. I'm a licensed uh, behavior analyst in the state of New York. I don't even need to take the EPPP anymore because, you know, I just use that. I have a small private practice. I work with um, adults in college um, that are diagnosed with autism, and I help them navigate the crazy social world and the demands of being a neurodivergent individual, you know, on a campus where some things, you know, are a little bit novel and a little bit more tricky. And um, one of my clients, I'll just say this, uh, she, I started working with her when she was 12. Uh, she was the first student I ever worked with um, on my internship as a school psychologist. And I worked with her for many, many, many years. And when she turned 21, her mother had reached out to me and was like, she needs a therapist. She, you know, she wants to work with you. This is what's going on. And can you, can you make this happen? And I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not licensed. I can't, I can't see her. And then, you know, every year she'd ask me and then the pandemic came and then licensing came in New York State finally became licensed. And now, you know, she and I have been working together for a thousand years and I love how things always come, you know, full circle. Um, and I find the work to be really valuable. And I learned so much from her about the experience of a college student. So it makes me a better professor, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more clear with the directions, um, you know, what the expectations are. Um, but school psychologists administer, you know, they do everything, you name it. They, they administer cognitive and achievement testing. They do behavior scales. They, they write behavior plans and, and functional behavioral assessments to identify, you know, problematic behavior and how to eradicate it. We do staff consultation. Um, we write a lot of in-home behavioral training programs. I'm really sorry if there's like a lot of noise coming from outside. Um, I hope it's not too distracting. Me, I don't hear it, but then I just realized that it might be loud for you guys. So um, I'm sorry for that. Um, I loved working at Eden because I felt like I was an integral part of the team. I was making a difference. But um, the thing about nonprofits is salary, you know? So I had to leave Eden and, and then I started working at the Department of Education. Go New York City DOE. Um, I worked in the district office in Brooklyn. And it was a really tough job because you were the liaison to all of the private schools, charter schools, you know, residential programs, day treatments. And, um, you know, I, my experience coming from a, an intensive behavioral uh, day treatment program really did help me, um, you know, settle nicely in that district position. But I really missed working with the students directly and having those relationships. And so I transferred to um, District 75. And somewhere in between there, I applied to Fairleigh Dickinson University's doctoral program and learned under some of the best psychologists I've ever known in my life, Dr. You know, Ron Dumont, who is a testing, anything you, anything you hear about IQ testing and achievement testing, he has had his finger on it. And um, Judith Kaufman, who recently, um, who recently passed huge in, in my development of becoming less and less behavioral and a little bit more eclectic. So I don't really necessarily consider myself a behavioral psychologist, but I'm more of like a cognitive behavioral psychologist. And I'm a little bit more into sensory stuff, you know, so don't tell my BCBA friends that I said that, but, you know, um, she really taught me to draw upon different, different disciplines in psychology. And there's so many of them. Um, I currently work in District 75 for the New York City Department of Education. I am a psychologist working um, sort of in a counseling role, uh, and it's amazing. I, I work in a high school. There are students that we have uh, varying disabilities. So we have classrooms where we have um, individuals diagnosed with autism who have um, you know, very low IQs, they're nonverbal, very behavioral. We have classrooms with individuals that have autism and they, you know, they're verbal, but they have some you know, quirky behavior. Then we have individuals that are, you know, not quite diagnosed bipolar yet because they don't meet, you know, the, the there's a lot of emotional needs um, in, in all of our students. And so there's a 
huge spectrum of emotional dysregulation that goes on on a daily basis. Um, what I do here is all of the mandated counseling. I write behavior plans. I write the functional behavioral assessments. I am the uh, sex sex on the condom girl. You know, you, you you know, I teach kids about safe sex. I'm the LGBTQ liaison. I am the child abuse liaison for the entire organization. So I interface often with ACS. Any case of us uh, of child abuse, not just at my site, but across the 600 students in our entire organization. I'm the person that kind of works directly with um, ECS. I do staff training. I, I consult with parents, outside providers. I do all the vocational assessments, uh, help develop career tracks. I connect them to outside agencies, whether it be OPWDD or AccessVR or any of these other city organizations and city organizations. I'm the person that's like, we need this and let's get it out there. And, you know, um, I'm really very fortunate because the people that I work with, everybody like, it's, sometimes it's too much help, you know? <laughs> like, there'll be a student in the hallway having a complete meltdown and I'm there talking to them. And then the more people come, the, the bigger it gets because of the attention. And I'm like, oh, I love that everybody's coming to help. Um, it's just, it's a wonderful place to work. Um, but my day starts 30 minutes before I'm actually on the clock. So I sit and have a cup of coffee with the people that I work with. And I find that that's where I get all the secrets, you know, all the gossip, which kid needs, which kid had a tough day yesterday, which kid did I not notice had a tough day yesterday? Did a parent communicate with you? Did the student leave and there was a conflict? Did something pop up on social media? Has there been a bullying accusation? What happened at the bus stop? You know, so we all kind of sit together and, you know, I check in with different people. I work very closely with my site administrator. Usually people are like, administration, but I actually really get along with our site administrator. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I'm an Aquarius and I really think outside in a different plane. And I hate to use astrology, but there's really no other way to describe it. Um, I see a problem and I don't think of the simplest solution. I think of the one that's going to be the hardest one, um, but tends to be the most effective. And then my coworker, my administrator is the level-headed one. And she's like, okay, Let's bring it down from Pluto to Earth where it needs to be. And so I work really well, um, you know, putting things together and, and developing new plans. And we roll out a lot of new things. And the things that we do here are pretty novel and unique for District 75. And so my supervisor in the main offices is, you, know, you want to present on that? You want to talk about this? So they take a lot of the things that we do and they try to implement it citywide or they try to roll it out. Um, you know, so I'm really proud of the work that I do um, in collaboration with the entire team here because everybody here is personally invested in the students. Um, you know, they're they're out there, they're a positive outcome. You know, we I've had students that have been arrested. I, I've had students that were victims of of trafficking. Um, I've had students that were sexually assaulted in parks in the Bronx. It is a really tough job emotionally. Um, I have to take a nap when I go home. I have to close my eyes for an hour before I shift into a different role in my life. I'm a single mom of three. I'm also an adjunct at SPS in Queens College. That takes up a lot of my time. I coach their basketball teams. I, you know, I'm, I try to be super mom, um, but I need that hour because as much as this job is really rewarding and wonderful, and when you see a student who was struggling with something and now they're they have mastered it, like. It, it will bring you to tears, you know, um, or when a student comes in and they identify you as the person that they trust. I don't trust anybody except for you. There's something like really beautiful about that connection and the relationship. And that's what keeps me coming to work every day. Um, despite that there's a lot of red tape, you know, let's just say working in a, in a city school. Um, I really love high school. I think that this is where the magic happens. You really start to see the spark of pathology. Hormones are a hell of a drug, you know, <laughs> they just, they, they play such a critical role. And um, I have a very strong um, bio, you know, neuropsych psych background. Um, and so I really draw on like, well, what is, what did the last physical say? Like, do we have high and low hormones? Like what, what's going on here? I try to refer students out for neuropsych assessments and, you know, clinical trials, if there are different things going on. Um, 
you know, I just, I just, I, I'm going to leave it at that because I feel like I'm going, am I, am I okay on time? Like, I don't. You're wonderful. Okay. You're wonderful. Right. But I've got questions for you. Um, oh, okay. And, and please um, uh, post any questions that you have in the chat and I will ask the questions or you can also um, request to be unmuted and you can ask the questions on camera, but please ask questions in the chat. So I wanted so you mentioned so many different things, uh, Dr. Mahoney, that you do. And I wanted to know if you could give us just very briefly a summary of what your typical day looks like, because you've mentioned a fascination with data. You've mentioned um, that you work collaboratively, collaboratively with all of these different people that you. It, so what does your day look like? It's um, it's really busy. Uh, I'm the first one here and I'm the last one out. Um, that's by choice. You know, there are other psychologists that, you know, they, there's a hard fit, the hard start and a hard stop. Um, I come in, I drink my coffee, I check in with the staff, figure out what's going on. Um, I have developed a like social emotional check-in that gets distributed. It's being piloted in two of our most, um, I want to say dangerous classrooms. Those are students that engage in very aggressive, very violent behavior. So if they come in and they're triggered, I know to have a check-in with them in the morning. So I, we all stand outside, you know, so my day starts at eight. I read my emails. I consult with my administrator from eight to 8.30. 8.30, the students come in. Everybody in the program, we line up and we stand outside of our doors and we almost have like a welcoming parade. You know, it sounds really lame because we're high school, but this is something that like absolutely 100% changes the student's day. So we all stand outside. Good morning. Hey, how you doing? Love your haircut. You look great. Oh, that's a new fit. All right, great. You know, and, and then students be like, can I talk to you later? And I'm like, yes. Um, so then I sit down at my desk at about 8.40. I look to see who's on my schedule because I do all the mandated counseling. I have eight to nine counseling sessions a day. So I write my schedule. I have multiple um, notebooks with to-do lists and anytime something pops up, I, I kind of prioritize it right now, semi-important and I can do it tomorrow. Um, so anything that goes on the right now, I kind of tackle off between 8.40 and nine o'clock, nine o'clock, I start my sessions. If I have a student that's absent, um, I'll use that time to call parents, um, connect with some of the community liaisons that we're affiliated with. We have, a, I've gotten a lot of people from outside organizations to come in to work with our students, uh, specifically for transition so that they have a very smooth transition from school age programming to adult, you know, services. Um, sometimes I spend time just looking to see what the Department of Mental Health has to offer for our case management, things like that. Um, I participate in all of the IEP meetings. So uh, the individual education plan. So if we're making recommendations for, you know, uh, program changes, uh, increases in counseling, decreases in counseling, I'm um, that person. Um, during the day, I can't say that I ever, ever fully make it through the full schedule. Um, there's always something that pops up, whether a student is in crisis and requires, you know, de-escalation. Uh, when that happens, I get a knock on my door or a phone call or a student just running in saying, ah, I need your help. And then take the time to sit with them and de-escalate them however long that takes. If there's a psychiatric um, emergency, um, I call 911, I go with them to the hospital, sit in the psych ER until their, their parents show up or then transfer them over to a social worker. Um, I create all of the... Um, like social emotional um, skills like that we do, you know, skill building. So some of our students don't have um, the emotional vocabulary to fully express themselves. And so then they engage in externalizing behaviors. So I work with the, the staff. I do uh, monthly staff trainings on positive behavior supports, um, how to redirect um, students based on, you know, their energy level. So if they're really high energy, angry, Maybe you don't redirect them with a loud voice, you know, and just kind of teaching people um, how to work with different types of students that have a varying level of need because not not everything works for each other. So I I don't have like a typical day, um, but I have. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Like it's not a typical day, but I do a whole bunch a of things. 
but but mostly, you know, I'm the I'm the counseling person. I, you know, if students having trouble, even the staff, like at the end of the day, um, without fail, there's an adult in here that's like, dude, what do I do about my kid? Or my marriage is is having a hard time. Or do you know any therapists outside? Um, I do a lot of like outreach to parents, you know, about trying to connect them, connect their kids to different services and programs outside. Um, so that's really what. I would say that's what a week looks like. Does that sound? Yeah, it sounds like you have a huge portfolio and that different things pop up and you have to adjust um, and do a lot of thinking on your feet to figure out what's appropriate given the circumstance, the situation, the context, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. In the chat, I and I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, so Seda Johnson says, I just want to applaud you, Professor. You have a hectic schedule and you still manage to do so much for others. Um, so uh, thank you for the comments, Seda, and please add your comments and questions. Nicole uh, Patillo, you have your hand up. Um, please um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, so I, it's not so much as a question. Um, I do want to thank you, Professor. You wrote me an amazing letter of recommendation and I did get into Hunter. Yay. For ABA, or well for ABA I guess um but I am on track to do my uh, BCBA and get my BCBA in two years so thank you I really do appreciate that and, oh that's the best news oh congratulations <laughs> um thank you I appreciate that and you know um having you as a professor and then hearing you know what you do on a daily life it's it, it sounds very intense um but yeah, I just wanted to say that you're doing great things and I do really appreciate that lot of recommendation. You're welcome. Anytime. And if you need anything while you're in your master's, I mean, ABA, you know, it's kind of my, kind of my heart right there. So, um, you know, feel free to like continue to reach out even when you're in Hunter. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Best of luck to you. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. So, um, Dr. Mahoney, in your description of your day to day, you mentioned, or and also of your training, you mentioned a few different courses you took. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about how biopsychology, um, you know, research methods, and other courses that you took inform what you do in your uh, daily practice? Can you tell us about the connection between your education and what you do every day as a school psychologist? So, you know, as I was saying before, like I really love love the hard sciences. So, you know, when you're working with adolescents, there is a surge in hormones and, you know, you, and even when you're working with younger kids, there's this rapid brain development. So across the, across the, the developmental trajectory of like, you know, young people to, to adulthood, you know, there are different periods where the biological mechanism that's going on in a different part of the body is like critical um, for what we would consider sort of a typical you know, development. And then we sort of see things when there's abnormal brain, you know, development, we see atypical behavioral patterns. And so what I like to do as much as I can is, you know, really get a lot. And then sometimes the parents are not always transparent, but before we do any sort of like behavioral intervention, I always recommend to the parents to get a full physical, you know, a medical, you know, what are their hormones look like? Is, is, are they, they showing signs of depression because their thyroid is low? Are they showing signs of really high anxiety because their thyroid is high? You know, are there issues with their adrenal glands? Are there issues with their pituitary glands? Um, are we having um, really painful, painful periods because there are issues with estrogen and progesterone and, and those, you know, high rates of those hormones or low rates really do affect behavior. I mean, as a female, I'll tell you, you know, I know what my levels aren't right. So does my family. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, it's just taking that knowledge um, and knowing that there are different parts of the brain, there are different parts of the endocrine system that truly affect our behavior and, and our thinking patterns. So I try to talk to students a lot about their health. You know, what are you eating? Um, what does your exercise look like? And then if the parent does send back the medical, I mean, we have a really great nurse here. I got to say where I work, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal team. The nurse, um, she will shake down these parents and she'll call doctor's offices and she will get all of the information um, that we need to make really sound clinical decisions. Um, I love research methods. I didn't love it. 
um, as an undergraduate student. In fact, I hated research methods. I hated statistics. Why? I was afraid of it. You know, it was, it was a scary class. Um, but then somehow in my graduate program, um, I just kind of found this love for data. And at my job at Eden, you don't you dare come to a meeting without an Excel spreadsheet, you know, a graph, a line graph of what the behavior trends look like. Because if you're going to present something, it better it better be very clear. And all the interventions that we used were based in research. And if you don't know how to search the journals, and if you don't know how to identify the independent variable, the dependent variable, if there are different levels of those variables, it's actually quite hard to replicate the study. And so when you're doing replication, it's really important, um, you know, because I find that you only you'll only see the study once in a journal, which kind of bothers me because it's like we have so many groundbreaking studies and they've only been done once and, and on one specific population. And so what I like to do is take the pillars of the field like um, Brian Awada. He is one of the most amazing behavior analysts out there. He's in the University of Florida, Florida, Florida State University. Um, but I like to replicate his uh, studies on self-injury and assessment methods for, you know, um, functional analysis. And that was a, a passion of mine for a really long time, but it all came from research methods. And just sidebar, um, I taught uh, at, at Hunter College and, and I had this really wonderful professor. His name was John Jacobs. And he did a lot of he was my research psychology professor. And we looked at adult attachment, which I was like, adult attachment. You know, but then I like two weeks in, I was like, oh my God, if I'm not anxious and bibble, I don't know what I am. <laughs> and then I started to realize that it's that there was a lot of validity to the studies. And and when I went back to Hunter College as a faculty member, John Jacobs was still there. And I got to write him an email and be like, hey dude, I am sure you don't remember me, but um my grandmother had died. Like she really died. Like, I'm not kidding. Like she legit passed away. And it was the day before my um, experimental psych final. And he demonstrated such a level of kindness and compassion that I had never really experienced before from an, from an, from an educator. And that's kind of what made me want to like be on the other side of the podium at some point to like be a compassionate person for college students who are going through stuff. Um, and, it, you know, so I use a lot of the research methods. I'm sorry, I can go from Alaska to Florida and back um, just to find good interventions. And, um, you know, having a strong knowledge of psychopathology, which really is, I love it. Um, not that I walk around diagnosing people because that's not right and that's completely unethical and I don't have the, it, it's just, it, you're not allowed to do that and don't try. Um, but having an understanding of what ages people should be diagnosed certain things, you can really help a parent um, and direct them to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a neurologist and say, well, you know, you're between, you know, zero and five, you really want to go and screen for autism. You really want to maybe look at some, from some ADHD, you know, things are consistent with this, this diagnosis. You want to go have this looked at. Um, and so having that understanding that pathology pops up at different points in their life, you know, like I have a couple of students here that are in their late teenage years, which is the onset of schizophrenia, you know, so I keep an eye on, on those students. Also, um, psychopharmacology, which was a class that I took in my, my graduate program, but it was really valuable because side effects and, and black box warnings and tardive dyskinesias and all, all these different things that like you wouldn't really think about now uh, because I've learned it in college and I've learned all about the theory of it, I'm able to apply that and, and my, I might see something pop up before um, you know, a teacher might because of because of the solid education that I got in being able to treat uh, an individual from like a biopsychosocial model. Thank you, thank you so much. You've you've made so many connections uh, to different things that we get as part of our graduate training in psychology. I think sometimes classes seem disconnected uh, from what we do, you know, in terms of our day-to-day -day practice, uh, but 
it's and that's that's why we need to hear from people who are doing the work who are um, in the trenches, so to speak, uh, as to what you know they got in terms of their education that contributes to how they see the world and how they do um, their how they do their jobs. Um, so you mentioned the importance of development and knowing what happens when. Obviously, I'm a developmental psychologist, and what I always say to um, students is developmental psychology is not the same thing as school psychology. It's also not the same thing as clinical psychology. And you know, you're a school psychologist. Could you tell us um, just in not in detail, but what school psychology is and what you know training as a school psychologist looked like while you were in it, um, and anything that students should know about you know what it means to be a school psychologist. Um, so, you know, school psychology is, you know, looking at, uh, uh, there's so much that goes on as a school psychologist that that's probably the toughest question that you're going to ask me. Um, we look at, the we look at a student in, 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 in totality. We look at emotional needs, behavioral needs, academic needs. We assess all three of those areas. School psychologists are responsible for classifying students, um, that have educational uh, an educational disability, such as you know learning disabilities, um, autism. We don't we don't diagnose. Um, if if you wanted uh, you know to have your your child's diagnosed with ADHD, you'd have to go to a psychiatrist for that. We make reckon, we we do a lot of um, assessments and and behavior scales to sort of get you know all the information together for the parent, and then we make decisions based on that data. Um, school psychologists help treat behavior. So if you have a student who is overly, you know, little kids when they're biting, we, we make bad behavior plans for that. Older kids when they're joining gangs, when they're fighting in the, in the, at the bus stops, um, when they're engaging in unhealthy sexual behavior, we develop behavior plans for that. Um, we work very closely with the families to see what the needs of the family are and how this child is functioning within the home. Um, School psychologists are, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say this because I am one, um, we're really undervalued in the schools and not a lot of people know all of the things that we can do. We're the testers and we're the um, gatekeepers for special education and that's it. But we are responsible for systems changing. We implement school-wide um, interventions and systems to increase academic learning, and social emotional functioning. We, um, oh, I don't want to get into it, but there's so many things that we do and that we can do, but um, it's really valuable work if you find, you know, the right school. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat and then we'll go to um, Salvatore. So in the chat, uh, Leticia Garcia asks, are you responsible for providing the child with IEP? Yes, uh, so my job at the district, so my role here in District 75 is slightly different. Uh, it's a conflict of interest for me to classify and make program recommendations. So, cause you know, administration can be like, well, he's he's really aggressive and our numbers are up. You gotta get that kid out, you know? So we have a district person from D1 D to 31 to make those recommendations. But a school psychologist is the person responsible for doing the assessments and determining if there is um, if they are eligible for an educational classification. I write the entire social developmental piece for the IEP. I write the measurable post, um, the, the uh, uh, post-secondary measurable goals. I write the coordinated transition plan. And then when our students leave, I write their exit summaries and their, um, just their transition plan in general. It's like a 40 page document and then it gets sent to wherever they're going. But yeah, I have a huge part in the development of the IEP. Thank you. For those who may not know, the IEP is the Individualized Education Program. Um, and um, just, we have a question. Salvatore, your hand was up. Could you um, unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, hi. Actually, I have two quick questions. Um, I was wondering how you um, involve family members or community within a, um, um, a behavioral um, management program. And I was wondering also, what were some limitations that you may have come across in the field as well? 
those answers are actually the same. So um, thanks for the question. Uh, I, I usually start to get a little, I, I get buy-in from parents by implementing behavior plans first in school and then demonstrating that it was an effective strategy. And then the parent has the choice as to whether or not, because the research shows that, you know, when, when there's a plan going in all different settings, not just school, um, the, the outcome for the student is much better. Um, some parents are, they want to do stuff at home. And then there are other parents that are a lot more resistant. The parents that are resistant, we just continue to keep reaching out, to keep trying, sending materials home. Our speech teacher here is in the, I can't make materials. They look like stick figures. She is a whiz um, with graphics and all that other stuff. So I kind of just go to her and I'm like, we need this and she makes it. And then we send it home. And then we we do a lot of, we teach our, you know, cause I'm lucky that my students are older. We I use a lot of self-monitoring programs where we teach the student to monitor their own behavior if there is um, no involvement from the parent, which happens a lot, more so than I want to admit. So when students don't, when parents don't have that active buy-in, we then start to teach the student how to, how to monitor their behavior in outside settings. Um, if the parent isn't able to implement the behavior plan for, you know, and there are parents that, that their child is so aggressive towards them at home that it's actually dangerous for them to do it. We connect them to outside agencies, to OPWDD for ComHab workers, and there are a million different things to do. Um, the big drawback um, as a school psychologist is that there isn't a lot of parental buy-in. Um, and, and now we're starting to see a huge increase in student apathy. They, they, they kind of don't care. Um, you're gonna get in trouble or we're gonna have to call your mom and let her know that you brought pot to school. I don't care, you know, or, you know, um, when you go out to the bus stop, you know, you gotta make sure that your, your clothes are, are properly fit in your body. You can't have things hanging, I don't care. Um, if you don't do your schoolwork, you're not gonna get a, a good fund of knowledge and reading. I don't care. So there's a lot of, or um, you got to come to school to get your education. I don't care. There's so much more of that now. And um, so I would say that those are the two big things that we're kind of dealing with is that we really want to get the parents involved and they, they don't really want to. And then the students are also less, uh, they're not as quick to buy into their own, their own personal growth um, as, as they used to be. Thank you. And um, so I have a follow up question and then let's go to well, we will go to the chat. So my follow up question is, so is so you mentioned that we see that you see a lot of student apathy now. Is this a big shift from what you saw towards the beginning of your career? Um, how have young people changed from, you know, when you first uh, started working with young people to, you know, right now in 2023? So there's, um, you know, I stand on a soapbox every now and then. Um, I, I feel like the access, like the over-reliance on um, social media, YouTube video looping, you know, this is where biopsychology comes into play. Um, I keep my phone on black and white because you're constantly looping color, you're getting a, an influx of dopamine. Anytime it's a blue and then there's something red, you get dopamine. And these kids are getting all these dopamine and serotonin you know, influx. And then when the video is off and they have to put their phone down to eat dinner, they, they get upset. So the, um, they're, they're, I feel like this is such a complicated question. Um, I do feel there is a shift between how students used to approach their academics and their career goals to how they do it now. Um, what I see with my students personally is a lot of learned helplessness. I had a student say to me yesterday, I just turned 18. You guys didn't get me a job. And I was like, oh, bro, we've been practicing mock interviews. We've, I've done multiple career assessments, ironed down that we're going to work in either the Amazon warehouse or FedEx. Um, you know, are you ready to go on interviews? Well, I don't want to go on interviews. You just got to get me the job. And, you know, I'm shy. And I was like, bro, it's not really, that's not how it works out. Whereas a couple of years ago, I would quite literally with my terrible handwriting, write out addresses and, and times and dates and when you were supposed to go to the interview. And my students, regardless of their, their level of disability, would make, it, would make it there. 
and they would go on their interview and whether or not they got the job, they went. Um, there's also a little bit less parental support too. Um, whereas years past, kids who weren't travel trained, their families would take them. You know, there was a lot more collaboration. I, I just, there are so many things that I think contribute to this, but I, that, that's, a, that's another talk for another time. Um, but I do see a shift and it's even in my own kids. I have two teenagers at home, 14, 16, 10. My 14 year old and my 16 year old, they're, they're really smart and they're great kids. Sometimes they don't want to go to school. And I'm like, but your education, your, your future. And they're like, yeah. you know, and I'm like, ah! like panicking over it. Um, you know, so it's, it's across all the houses The kids just, you know, kids are being kids. And I, and my son tells me I'm a generationalist, generation, generationalism, um, that, I, you know, every generation thinks the one after them is, is terrible. And I hope, I hope that that's true, you know, um, but anyway, so I, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Um, so we, let's go to the chat. So we have a question from Jessica Morell. Um, do you also see other students who don't fall into the high at risk category? Um, or how are these students, how are these students, to, uh, how, are, how do you determine when students need help? For example, students who don't feel comfortable approaching you. So students who may not be high risk and don't feel comfortable approaching you, how do you determine when they need help and how to help them? So all of our high risk students, like I've been very lucky that like, I don't really, they know when, because in the, each teacher in the program are like, you have a problem, you go to this woman. Um, there are certain students who have better relationships with their one-to-one -one para. So they'll tell their one-to-one -one para or they'll tell a different school, um, you know, official that they're having a hard time, that there's abuse going on in the home, that there's drug use going on, they, they're, they're um, homeless. And then based on, like, they don't, they won't break trust if it's something low level, but if it's something really serious like that, the teachers and the powers would come to me and be like, hey, listen, I think they're homeless, you know? So the staff will help advocate for those students. We're actually in a co-located building. So my school is a, a D75 school. We have a wing of a public high, like a 3000, you know, student public high school. And some of the students that aren't in our program have made their way and we sit, we lunch. Um, I don't know them from a hole in the wall. They don't know me from a hole in the wall. And then just one day there, we have this beautiful relationship. And then I'm like, have you gone to your guidance counselor about this? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that's where you gotta go. So here in, in education, we find that the students usually have one person and they'll tell that one person. Um, and if not, they, they wait until they do feel comfortable, but we usually figure stuff out. Um, and I do have a student that does not want to engage in any sort of um, counseling activities. Um, he's a new student of ours. Uh, the, release, the rapport building has been, you know, a little difficult and challenging, but, you know, you just kind of keep at it. I keep saying, you know, it comes in, I'm like, listen, we talk, we can sit here and we can listen to soft rock because that's what he indicated on his check-in one day that he liked soft rocks so where I'm like, we'll put the Billy Joel on. I don't have a problem with that. And then last week he came into the office and I'm like, do you want to talk or do you want to listen to music? He's like, I want to talk. It's all right. And the topic was school shootings and gun control. And I was like, oh my God, this kid is tearing himself apart with anxiety about coming into school. And that's why he's absent for three days after a mass like shooting. It, it just, it was this big aha moment. And so now I'm able to sort of like see how it goes, but it does take time. Like I will be that annoying person that will, like, I'm not gonna like make you like me, but I'm gonna make sure I'm standing next to you or standing in your classroom and, you know, that you know that I'm available if you need me. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica, for the question. Please keep posting your questions in the chat. So in the chat, Leticia says, I really love, I would really love to do what you do. Um, and uh, several people hearted that message. Um, and I, I think I've told you before, uh, Dr. Mahoney, that uh, what you do is the dream job in many ways for people who want to make a difference. Um, so you mentioned school shootings. Um, I remember, and you mentioned, you know, violence, issues of violence. Um, 
during earlier in your talk. Um, I remember when I was doing my dissertation and I was collecting data in New York City public schools, and it was just a few days after uh, Tamir Rice was shot. And I was, uh, t uh, I was in um, school collecting data with young people and having these conversations uh, with them that I did not initiate. You know, you're there collecting data and you say to yourself, oh, I'm here for one purpose. I'm going to do what I'm here to do. And of course, with young people, they draw you in. And if you are the right type of adult, you meet them where the, where they are, right? And it sounds like that's something that you're doing. So how do you talk to young people about violence and about school shootings, since this is something that is unfortunately part of their reality in a way that it wasn't part of, for example, your reality or my reality or anyone else who, you know, is a, a, a teeny bit older than uh, 18 uh, than, or than 30 even, you know, it, this is part of their day to day. Um, but so how do you talk to them about these issues? So there are certain students that, you know, have a really great understanding of what's going on, some that have somewhat a limited understanding, and then some that that really don't understand, except for when we're doing a soft lockdown, this is this is the procedure. So when I'm working with students that experience very high levels of anxiety related to mass shootings, I also work with a lot of a lot of young men of color, you know, and they're they're coming in and they're talking about issues that they've experienced, um, you know, being a young person um, in New York City, you know, and, and so we kind of like what it's similar but different. Um, in school, I always try to kind of review all of the policies that are in place for the students to be safe. Then I have them identify certain people that they feel most comfortable with. And then I tell them, you know, when you come in on that day, if you're feeling overly anxious about it, go seek that person out. Ask that para to sit next to you. Um, you can come into my office. I do a lot of guided meditations here where, you know, we are trying to teach um, how to calm your body when there's all this chaos going on. And really just, really just trying to emphasize the you know, we're on the second floor in a very obscure part of the building. We have locks on all of the doors. We have screens that go over the glass part. Your, your um, desk is all the way in the back. Nobody can see you. There are blinds. You know, so I really just point out all of the things in the environment and then give them an opportunity to, you know, talk about their fears. And then we process the fear in, is this an immediate fear or is this, something that I'm just really, really, really scared about and I need to know more about it and I need to know how to calm myself down when I'm, when I'm worrying. Um, we did have um, a student bring a gun into the school last year and that, you know, that, that really made, um, it made things very difficult, not just in the school, but also from a community perspective because then we became the school who had the kid with the gun and then everybody was just up in arms about it. Um, school safety, uh, the citywide school safety, they do scanning, you know, they go through the metal detectors and there are students that if, you know, they constantly bring a weapon in, they have to be scanned every day. So we'll make those referrals to our school safety, school safety role in the hallway. So I just, you know, point all of these things out just to kind of let them know that, yes, yeah, school, school shootings are horrible and, and they're terrible, but, you know, this, um, these are the things we're doing to keep you safe. Do you have any other suggestions for us that you think would keep you safe? So trying to get that person's feedback, um, you know, and that actually kind of helped because he wrote a whole plan um, on what he would like to have done in this in the classroom and in the school, you know, to, you know, feel more safe. So we have a follow up question from uh, Leticia Garcia. What happens to that child? So what happened to that child? He's still here. You know, he comes in. Um, we have like a little bit of, you know, he does the morning check-in. So if he's nervous about something, he'll tell me. And he's brought up the school shooting thing maybe once after we spoke about it. I'll check in with him, but I won't say, hey, man, how are you feeling about school shootings today? Um, I'll say to him, you know, what, what's your anxiety level about being here in school? And then he knows that that means, you know, do you feel safe? And so he'll communicate. He'll communicate that. He's still very quiet in counseling. Um, but he is opening up more and he's very open to feedback on how to feel safe and, and, and feel calm. 
So we're again, doing a lot of like guided meditations and just like um, mindfulness training so that, you know, when he does kind of get into that state, he can bring himself down. Thank you. I see so many connections. So connections to coping theory, connections to, you know, neuroscience and it's, and um, um, how, how meditation changes, you know, the brain and responses that we have. There are so many connections that we can make to topics that are covered, you know, in psychology courses. Um, we have one last question in the chat, and then I'm going to ask you a final question. So the question in the chat is from Salvatore, and it's, do you think some other fields of psychology should take more ideas from applied behavior analysis, perhaps IO? Um, Salvatore is uh, on the verge of completing his uh, master's in IO, I should tell you. So behavior analysis has its own little uh, subsection called um, uh, behavioral management or be behavioral organizational behavioral management. I'm sorry, it's been a minute. Um, and that that is utilized like uh, companies hire behavior analysts to put reinforcement procedures uh, you know, a reinforcement incentive packages in to increase employee productivity and incentives for bonuses and how to handle like different types of things. Um, I think I, there's so much going on in this office right now. I'm sorry. That's my, that's my administrator calling me to tell me that I need to go and check on something. But um, I think that all, like I, I, you know, is, is a really a fascinating um, discipline of psychology. So it was applied behavior analysis they could have a beautiful marriage because in order to be like highly successful, like business is very black and white. There really isn't a lot of gray area and applied behavior analysis is, is a lot of black and white and very little gray area. It is what it is. And you take what you, you know, and so um, you should check out behavioral organizational management um, as a, as a, a, a subsidiary of, of a behavior analysis and utilize that in your, you know, your practice as an INO psychologist. Um, Thank you so much. And so final question, because you have, we know we have, you have to run. Um, you mentioned that at the end of your day, you get home and you take a one hour nap. Yeah. Now, very often we don't think enough about psychologists, teachers, doctors, uh, medical doctors and their well-being. Um, but it's very, as you and I both know, it's very important to do things that help us make it through you know, the difficult um, tasks that we have as part of our jobs. What else do you do in terms of self-care? How do you protect, you know, Dr. Lauren? So I really should, I really should state that my self-care, um, my nap, um, I had to, I had no choice um, to start doing that because I have lupus and I have um, an autoimmune um, kidney disease. And then I had cancer years back. So like, as I'm getting older, my resiliency um, is kind of declining a little bit. So I find that the nap really helps. Um, I, I really try to do a lot of self-monitoring of my own behavior. I try very hard not to be on my phone or like getting in an Instagram loop. Um, I read actual books. You know, I, I really stay like I'm, I'm, a nerd at heart. Um, I get very excited when the new journals come come out and they're published on the library. I'll print out two or three of them. That's my self care. I'll sit in my backyard with a hot cup of coffee, with the dogs running around, and and I'll read and I'll read the journal. I do a lot of walking. Um, I'm very fortunate living on Staten Island. Again, no judgment. Um, it was the only place where I could afford a house back in 2013, and even now it's it's completely unaffordable. But I live about a quarter mile from a really from from a beach, you know, it's kind of a crappy beach, but it's beach nonetheless. And so I I, I, I like to take my, my children, we go and we collect sea glass. I have a mason jar, we put the sea glass in there. Um, every single night before I go to sleep, I do in a, a guided meditation on the Calm app. It's free for educators. It might be free for students. So I don't know if they're still doing it, but I jumped on that every night. Um, I listen to a guided meditation before I go to bed. Um, throughout the day, you know, I, I I never really talk a lot about this in a professional setting, but I have a code that I follow, um, you know, throughout my life. And there are different steps that I take every single day to make sure that I am not sitting in too much ego, that I am not sitting in too much fear, 
that I'm not attention seeking. And so journaling at the end of the day to kind of make sure that my counseling sessions were not because I thought I had this great idea to tell this kid, but that that great idea was actually meaningful and valid for that person. So just a lot of self-reflection at the end of the day. Um, and I used to run so much. I ran the New York City Marathon a bunch of times. Um, but again, you know, my body has kind of had a health decline over the years, so I can't do that. But what I do is I make sure I get out, I play basketball. Um, I do a lot of walking. I love going swimming. So I will kind of just try to eat healthy um, every now and then. Like last week, I'll have candy for dinner. That's self-care too sometimes, deviating from the, you know, the clean eating and the healthy eating, just every now and then being a human and being like, yes, you know, I ate 15 Butterfingers and I'm okay with this. You know, <laughs> So those are just some things that I do. I also, um, I really enjoy spending time with my kids. And I, and I, I don't mean to sound like that person that like annoying mom, but like, I genuinely, my kids are really cool and I have beautiful relationships with them and very open and honest relationships. And I feel like when I talk to them, like I feel better, you know, I live with my, my sister lives with me and my, my brother-in-law. So I, I have other people to, you know, just sit with. And sometimes we just sit on the front stoop and that's it, you know, so um, just kind of taking a moment to like really be mindful and present, clear the clutter out of the head and focus on what is actually happening versus what I think is happening. And then that's how I kind of figure out, do I need to do some self-care or am I just being a diva? And that's, that's really that. Thank you so much. Um, so Nakia Isaac, who's our ac the academic specialist for the psychology program, says this was absolutely amazing. Dr. Mahoney, you have shared so much helpful information, and I echo that so sentiment. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us. Um, you have been wonderful, and you've made so many fantastic connections for us uh, during this short talk. I also want to I want to thank the tech team. I want to thank Molly Joyce. I want to thank Heather Zeman. This is our final lunch, uh, day in the life for the semester, and they've been absolutely wonderful with all the psychology events um, this semester, and we wouldn't be here without them. Um, but again, thank you, Dr. Mahoney, and we're going to let you go because we know you got a message on the loudspeaker telling you to run. <laughs> So enjoy the she rest. She called of me at 1250 and I told her one o'clock. So that's on her. <laughs> okay. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And if you have questions for Dr. Uh, Mahoney, please feel free to reach out to me and I will communicate them to her. You can also reach out to her directly. So have a wonderful day, everyone.